<clears throat> Good morning to everyone who's joining us uh, for the live stream this morning from the Smith Cove Baptist Church this Sunday, January 15th. The scripture reading I have chosen this morning is from Romans, and it's the last couple verses of Romans chapter 5, and then we move into chapter 6. So I'm starting at Romans chapter 5, verse 20. The apostle writes to the church in Rome to us today, the law was brought in so that trespass might increase. But where sin increased, grace increased all the more. So that just as sin reigned in death, also grace might reign through righteousness to bring eternal life through Christ our Lord. And then in chapter 6, beginning at verse 1, what shall we say then? Shall we go on sinning so that grace may increase? By no means. We are those who have died to sin. How can we live in it any longer? Or don't you know that all of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were therefore buried with him through baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. For if, with, if we have been united with him in death like his, we will certainly also be united with him in the resurrection like his. For we know that our old self was crucified with him so that the body ruled by sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves to sin, because anyone who has died has been set free from sin. Now, if we died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with him. For we know that since Christ was raised from the dead, he cannot die again. Death no longer has mastery over him. The death he died, he died to sin once for all. But the life he lives, he lives to God. In the same way, count yourselves dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. Therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body so that you obey its evil desires. Do not offer any part of yourself to sin as an instrument of wickedness, but rather offer yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life. And offer every part of yourself to him as an instrument of righteousness. For sin shall no longer be your master. Because you are not under the law. But under grace. Heavenly Father we thank you for your word. And we pray Lord that your spirit would write your word upon our hearts. We pray in Jesus name. Amen. Last Sunday's message had us looking at the two sides of where most professing Christians are where they sit in their beliefs. One, we can obtain and lose our salvation. Or two, once we have our salvation, we can never lose. This morning, we're, we're briefly going to look at what is termed as the contracts that God has instituted that brings holy God and sinful you and I into fellowship with one another. And I've spoken briefly this in past sermons about how the Old Testament of our Bibles is a covenant that God had made with Israel, and it was based upon the law. Of course, our New Testament, the new contract that God has made, it expands from the Jewish nation in the Old Testament to that of the non-Jewish people. That's you and I as Gentiles. Combined into one human race, of course, the new contract is based not on the law, but on God's grace. So it's now here where we're seeing the two sides of salvation that God offers. One was based on the law or our keeping the commandments. And the other is dependent upon God's grace that he offers us, of course, through accepting Jesus' sacrificial work on the cross. There are problems that come to us basing our salvation on one or the other. As we base our salvation upon the law, well, that leaves us condemned. Because we can't keep the law perfectly. And yet those who base salvation on God's sacrifice and grace. This can often end up with Christians treating his grace as a license to sin. 
Neither are these two scenarios or these approaches to God, they're not pleasing to God. The different sides of this goes a little bit like this. We've accepted Jesus. We believe that he is God in the flesh. He has sacrificed himself for us. He's fulfilled his own righteous requirements of the law perfectly because we couldn't. And I don't think any Christian would argue that point. If we add to God's grace and sacrifice, if we start adding things to it, many will say that by adding to this, and in this context, keeping the commandments, well, then our being saved is still dependent upon us keeping the rules, the laws. God's laws. People will say it's our, our works. More specifically, that our works translate into our not breaking the rules. So as people, if they're trying to live their Christian life like this, often people will label them, others, as legalistic. It's because they're trying to live by the legal code of the old covenant, the old agreement. Hopefully I haven't lost you. The other view or set of beliefs is, that, if you like, the other view is that we are saved by God's grace through faith in Jesus' sacrifice. And that's it. Nothing can be added to it. Now, this camp of believers will often quote a passage that I, I shared with you last week. I'm going to briefly share it again this week. Ephesians 2, verses 8 to 10. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not from yourselves. It is a gift of God, not by works so that anyone can boast. Many will end the quotation of that passage there, but we need to go a little bit further. As I strongly suggested last week, that we complete the, the point that the apostle was making. In verse 10, it says, for we are God's handiwork. We are God's handiwork created in Christ Jesus to do good works which God has prepared in advance for us to do. So I'm not going to repeat last week's message, but remember what James said in chapter 2. Our faith without deeds, our faith without works, he said, is dead. We don't want a dead faith. James even asked if, if such a faith like that, a dead faith, can that even save us? On the other hand, the problem of basing our salvation on God's grace without works. And just for a minute, let's not define works as being, uh, being good deeds done to help people. It can mean that. But let's also have works that include our Christian lives actually looking like Christian lives and obeying the commandments that God has given us. It's starting to get a little tougher now. When we base our salvation on God's grace and nothing much from us at all, believers can end up living like, well, they think that a, a Christian life, they think they're living a Christian life because they believe in God. They believe in his sacrifice and grace. But there's no attempt to live a godly life. Not living godly lies. And God's grace gets treated like it's a license to sin. Oh, now, we may not be saying, well, I'm going to sin this sin today. And it'll be okay because when I'm done, I'll just ask God for forgiveness later. I am hoping and praying that we don't live like that. Because if we are, we're in serious eternal trouble. But what many of us as believers are doing or not doing we're ignoring the fact that we are continuing to sin. And we know it's sin. And we make no effort to stop. Maybe just as bad. We sin, but we don't acknowledge what we do that is even wrong. Evidence of this. As our society and our world has changed and the world says this particular thing that was once considered sin, well, that's not sin anymore. So it's okay that we keep on living this way. Maybe this is why some of the pews are empty in many churches today. The truth for you and I as Bible-believing Christians is that we need a balance to all of this. Come on, Mark, get to today's reading. 
the apostle, as I mentioned earlier, he's writing to the church in Rome. This is a group of believers he is writing to. He's not writing to the unsaved. We received this letter in the scriptures. So this letter is to us as part of Christ's church. And I'm going to go through some of the reading. I'm going to comment as I go. Hopefully shorten the message up a little bit. In verse 20, the law was brought in so the trespass might increase. And Paul says, where sin increased, grace increased all the more. Paul's not saying that God brought in the law so it, and all these rules. He didn't bring in all these rules to make it tougher for us to be perfect. The laws are there so we live lives pleasing to God. The commandments are there to show us what displeases God or what actually sin is. The laws are there so that we treat other humans decently the way they should be treated. You can also say that the laws are there to show us our sin. God puts forth a number of these rules in the old agreement, the Old Testament. And in the New Testament, the New Covenant, we encounter God's grace. And you need to know this. You likely already do, but God's grace has been with us since day one, all through the Old Testament. It's only in the New Testament, the New Agreement, that grace becomes more prominent. Or it's revealed to us that God's grace is coming to us in a different way. Now God's grace is coming to us through his son, Jesus Christ. Before Jesus, sin ruled and brought death. In verse 21, just as sin reigneth in death, now the new covenant. Just as sin reigned in death, the new covenant says that grace might reign through righteousness to bring us eternal life. Once Jesus came and brought God's grace to us, we now have grace overruling the old covenant. And as grace rules in our lives, we have a righteousness that comes to us that we never had before. This righteousness is from none other than Christ. It's living. This righteousness is living and working in us and through us. And now eternal life is in our grasp, within our grasp, within our sight. But what ends up happening? We, if we focus so intently on God's grace, then we start ignoring the rules. The commandments. And now we land in chapter 6. Where Paul asks, what shall we say? Shall we end up sinning all the more? So that grace will increase? No, Paul says. We have died to sin. How can we live in it any longer? The message gets tougher. We're not supposed to be sinning. But grace is there if we do. I'm pretty sure you heard that. We're not supposed to be sinning, but we do. But we're allowing sin to continue in our day-to-day -day lives. Paul goes on to say that as we accept Jesus, as we're baptized, and in more than a symbolic way, we've died to sin. We are buried in the waters of baptism. As we come forth, it's like us being resurrected. I need to point out here that we, we don't have to be baptized to be saved. All we have to do is read the crucifixion story. That one thief on the cross, he wasn't baptized. He wasn't a church member. Jesus says, today you'll be with me in paradise. These verses about our sin and baptism, and us being dead to sin, they were covered in verses 3 to 5. Paul says in verse 6, For we know that our old self was crucified with him, so that that body that we had that was ruled by sin is done away with. Paul will mention also later in chapter 6 and early in chapter 7 that once we've died, sin has no mastery over us. The laws do not apply to us anymore once we've died. They're only applying to us while we live. So he says, for our old self was crucified so that the body ruled by sin might be done away with. So that we should no longer be slaves to sin. 
We're supposed to be dead to sin. As believers in Christ, we must not continue to be slaves to sin. Rather, we need to be slaves to Christ. Now, whoa, Mark, did you say that we're supposed to be slaves? Did you say the word slaves? Yes. The word servant. I remember many years ago in Romans chapter 1, Paul, the Apostle Paul, a servant of Christ Jesus. My mentor at the time says that servant. Well, that's another translation in older translations in your King James Version. It'll say Paul, a slave. Of Christ Jesus. So when we're reading the word servant, it translates slave. We are going to be slave to one or the other. We're going to be a slave to sin or to Christ. Maybe humanity, that includes us, maybe we find it easier to allow ourselves to be slaves to sin. Because after all, it doesn't appear to be too harmful now, does it? I'm being sarcastic. Because if that's what's going on in our subconscious, my sin's no big deal. We're in trouble. Look around our world. It's because of people allowing themselves to be slaves to sin, including us. This is why we see all the sorrow and misery, the greed and the hate, the senseless violence and murders. This is a result of people being slaves to what? Sin. We can fathom maybe sin. We may expect it from non-believers, but much of the slavery, the slavery of sin or to sin, it exists in you and I as believers. If you've ever thought that I'm stomping on your toes, mine are black and blue. Right now. So about now you might be asking. Maybe saying in your minds, Mark, are you saying that we should be living and not sinning? In short, yes. And now that I stated that, you might be thinking, that's not possible. You even said so before, Mark. It's not possible to live in this world and not sin. And that's also very true. But there's a large gap between not sinning and our sinning every time we turn around, every time we open our mouths, every time we allow the world to get in the way of our being slaves to Christ. The apostle says in verse 11, count yourselves dead to sin, but alive to God. Don't let sin reign in your mortal body, that you end up obeying its evil desires. Don't offer parts of your body to sin as an instrument of wickedness. In verse 14, sin shall no longer be your master because you're not under the law. You're under grace. So if we, you know, work to obey the law and then we end up taking others and maybe even, maybe we even disassociate from others because they still sin in these areas where we don't. We can soon find ourselves living in that kind of holier than thou kind of life. That's not going to help anyone find Christ. We can get so tied up in keeping the rules that we forget that grace that we've received, that grace that they have received as we continue along our merry little way and judge others, believing that they don't qualify for God's grace because they break the rules. On the other hand, if we easily accept God's grace through our trust and faith in Jesus' sacrifice, if we, if we base our relationship with God on this, which we should, but if and when we have done this and we don't allow God to have rule and reign in our lives and we keep on sinning as if there's no consequences, you know, it's okay. I'm covered by grace. This kind of so-called Christian life has people very likely thinking they're saved, but maybe they're not. Maybe we're not. Remember this. Basing our salvation upon the law leaves us condemned. 
because we can't keep the law perfectly. I think we understand that. But if we base our salvation on God's sacrifice, on his grace that's come to us through our trust in him, through Jesus' sacrifice, if we treat this grace as a license to sin, can we not at least agree that neither one of these scenarios, when we get to the rapture in the future, neither of these paths are going to end well? Is it possible to sin less? Even some of the biggest ones in our lives can, can be brought under control. Sinning less, making progress in our spiritual growth and our faith. These kinds of life experiences happen when we're willing to be slaves to God. And at the same time, we're willing to accept his help. To do what he wants us to do. There's those obvious sins. Some of you who know me more than others, you're probably listing off. There's one of Mark's sins, Mark's sins, Mark's sins. Trust me, I'm, I'm checking them too. There's those obvious sins that people do. And other Christians who don't commit those particular sins are quick to judge. But let me just uh, suggest a couple sins that we do. Maybe not all of us. Sins that maybe are not listed in the Ten Commandments even. But once Jesus had unpacked the Old Testament, once he starts really helping us as humanity makes some sense of how God wants us to interpret the Old Testament scriptures, we find that some things that we do, some sins are present in our lives. And well, we, we just continue to do them. Maybe not even recognizing that they're sin, and so we don't even seek forgiveness. Here's an example. Someone has wronged us, and we refuse to forgive them. Well, this is not loving one's neighbor. Jesus said we, we must forgive to be forgiven. Another is falsehood or lies. Do we gossip? It's a sin because we're tearing people apart. Are we people that just can't wait to get a juicy detail about someone and share it with others? It's sin. And we know it is, yet we continue to do it. One more. I could go on and on. Thou shalt not steal. We may all have done this. Sometimes we think little of it. But when we buy something, say, for example, I was just speaking to somebody about this the other day, and I'm not, this was already written. So this is not because and I'm not even going to look up. But when we buy something and we pay cash for it so we don't have to pay the taxes. Ouch. That's sin. I can go a little further. Still on the money thing. Are we disciplined when it comes to paying tithes to the Lord? If the answer is no, then we're robbing from the Lord. Failing at any of these is not pleasing to God. And for the most part, I think that we know that. This is what's called willful, willful sin. Willful. Willful sin. We sin and we know it. Yet because of God's mercy and grace, we sin these sins and then once in a while, we might ask for forgiveness. Or we're asking forgiveness for the 1500th time. I need to wrap it up. We need to find a balance. And it's true that we can't find salvation by no other means than that through God's grace coming to us. Through the sacrifice of his one and only son. Let's be clear on that. Saved by grace doesn't mean that we have a license to sin. We can avoid displeasing God if we would take our sins seriously and not shrug them off as minor or they don't have any consequences. Saved by grace, we're to be dead to sin. It shouldn't rule or reign in our lives. Christ is our master and we are his servants. His slaves. 
We're not supposed to sin. But if, and if in big capital letters, if we sin, we can seek God for forgiveness. But the process doesn't stop there. Repentance is part of the process. Repentance. Repenting means that we turn from that sin. We recognize it is sin. We ask for forgiveness and we turn from it. We show remorse. We fight to avoid sinning that sin. And we're not left powerless to fight against the sinful human nature. God realizes we're but flesh and blood. We're weak. But he has sent his Holy Spirit to not only convict us and show us what our sin is, but to empower us not to sin those sins. If we don't know how to utilize the Holy Spirit for help, then we just begin to seek God in deeper and more meaningful ways than what we have been. And God will show us not only where we go wrong, but helping us to stop allowing ourselves to be slaves to this sinful nature. God's laws are real. They're there for a purpose. They're there for our own well-being. They're there to show us that we're sinners and that we need Christ. And once we know that we need Christ, we, we need to ask, seek forgiveness. And in seeking forgiveness, we fight against that sinful nature, not to sin that sin again. It's mind-boggling. It shakes your head. Mark, it's not possible. On ourselves, by ourselves, I agree. But with God, there's nothing that's impossible. We're empowered by God to do what God asks us to do. So when our Christian lives are lived this way, we're finding a proper, a healthy balance between God's laws and his grace. We won't be legalistic, but we won't be treating God's Grace as some free-for-all license to sin that my sin doesn't matter. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, a tough, tough message, tough words to hear from you this morning, Lord, for all of us. Help us, Lord, not to, to shrug this off, all oh, it's impossible, and turn off and turn out the voice of your spirit in our hearts and minds. Keep working on us, Lord. We thank you for your mercy and grace. We seek for forgiveness, Lord, for treating it so cheaply at times. Help us, Lord, to know that you can empower us to, to overcome. You constantly tell us, Lord, for the future, for, for the one who overcomes, the one that holds firm to the truth, will be with you. We thank you for this, Lord. Lord, we lift up those who are, are needing help, spiritual help, maybe financial help, maybe physical issues. Lord, we, we ask your blessing, your healing. You convict us to help, to be an answer to some of those prayers. Lord, there are those who are mourning loss of loved ones. And we pray your comfort can be with them, that your peace to help them cope and, and continue on in their journeys. We pray for those, Lord, who are, are living in, in palliative care. Their lives may be soon ending. We pray, Lord, for, for strength for those journeys. But as we trust in you, we need not fear death. Heavenly Father, be a, a blessing to those who seek to fulfill our needs in our in our society, all of those who put themselves out there, keep them healthy and safe. We praise you and thank you, Lord God, for, for hearing our prayer. And we make this prayer how you have taught us to pray, Lord Jesus. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses 
as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Blessings on your week to each and every one, to our loved ones near and far. And keep washing your hands. It's safer that way. <laughs>